everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the Vibrant Health Podcast, hosted by myself, Jessica Espinoza, and my friend and colleague, Lydia Shatney. I am a wellness coach and educator whose main goal is to help inspire you to live your most vibrant life. You can find me writing about all things health and wellness over at deliciousobsessions.com and jessicaespinoza.com. Lydia is a nutritional therapist and founder of the Divine Health from the Inside Out.com website, where she works with clients all over the country and helps them improve and regain their health using nutritional and mineral balancing protocols. We are so excited that you're taking time out of your day to tune in. But before we get started, since this is a health related podcast, it should be noted that we are not licensed medical professionals. The information and advice provided in this podcast is not intended to diagnose, treat, or prescribe for any illness or health issue and should not be construed as medical advice. You should always consult with your medical practitioner before making any changes to your diet, supplementation, medication, or lifestyle. Now, on to today's episode. Thank you for tuning in. Let's get the show started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 37 of the Vibrant Health Podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. I am here with my co-host, Lydia, and we are very excited to have a special guest on the show today. So, Lydia, do you want to pop in and say hello and introduce our guest? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. This is Lydia. Today, we have a special guest, and our special guest's name is Sarah Russell. Sarah is a fellow nutritional therapy practitioner. She's also a certified GAPS practitioner and Weston Price chapter leader. And she's currently residing in the Tuscan countryside. And I had the pleasure of meeting Sarah this past March in Portland, Oregon at the Nutritional Therapy Association Conference. Sarah helps clients worldwide and she specializes in fertility and pregnancy and young children. She's the creator of Feed Your Fertile Body. This is a preconception preparation and fertility optimization group program and it's available exclusively to nutritional therapy practitioners, and consultants. Sarah enjoys wild crafting local herbs, preparing probiotic foods, and working on complex client cases. Today, she's joining us to talk about one of her favorite topics and one that I haven't really broached myself, so I felt it would be great to have someone who's more focused and an expert on this, and she's going to talk about fertility and preparing the body for pregnancy. So welcome, Sarah. We're so happy to have you here today. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate the introduction. Thank you so much. Sure, sure. We had uh, some good time to powwow at the conference and kind of talk about all the geeky things we like. So it was pretty <laughs> cool. <laughs> and you were there with your, your fertility course and everything. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, your fertility course sounds awesome. I know we'll talk about that a little bit towards the end of the show. But so I'm really excited to have you on the show because... The fertility thing is something that's on our minds right now. My husband and I want to start a family in the next year or two. And I have had, I have Hashimoto's, which I know that you'll cover a little bit in what you talk about today. Um, Mm -hmm. And then I've also had some other health problems come up as well. So um, kind of working through those and getting my body into a place where I feel comfortable and feel like I'm even ready to start trying to get pregnant, you know, is on the top of my mind right now, but I'm also concerned just from, you know, looking at the statistics of people who have autoimmune diseases, especially with the autoimmune thyroid diseases and issues with fertility. So I'm really excited to have you here today to kind of talk about that. So what are the most common causes of infertility that you've experienced in your practice and all the work that you've done? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm glad that you brought up Hashimoto's. It's definitely one of the top causes in my list that I, you know, that I've seen. Causes of both infertility and repeat miscarriages, I would definitely say the top three are Hashimoto's, poor blood sugar handling with and without PCOS. Sometimes you can have blood sugar handling issues without. If you have PCOS, you definitely have blood sugar handling issues on your hands. And the other one is underconsumption of healthy fats. Definitely, you know, if we had to do like a top five, I would add on Food sensitivities and excess inflammation, you know, they may sound a little generic, but, you know, they definitely do come up in practice and in the literature on fertility. Gotcha. So, yeah. should, do you want, should we go into the Hashimoto's a little bit more? This is a really big issue for so many people. I mean, even getting a diagnosis. I'm so excited, you know, first of all, that you are getting ready to start your family. And I think it's such a luxury to know before you even start trying that you have Hashimoto's because a lot of women who 
who start trying don't know. And, right. and that's one of the things that keeps people stuck. I almost, I kind of feel like it's at this point where I know so much that it's almost like it's becoming overwhelmingly scary for me because I know all of the bad things and the negative things. I've kind of lost that little bit of naivety, I guess, <laughs> when it comes to, to getting pregnant. So now I'm like over, I guess, over concerned with everything. So, <laughs> but yeah, with Hashimoto's, you know, Lydia and I both have a lot of people in our audience that have thyroid issues. And a lot of them may have undiagnosed Hashimoto's, but I feel like every day I'm meeting at least one new person who has Hashis. So it's, it's so common. So sure. yeah, maybe you could talk briefly a little bit about that. Yeah, definitely. So I think maybe one of the best ways to talk about this is through example. So one of the very first, well, one of the most memorable fertility clients I have is um, a woman who has, she currently has a one month old baby. And uh, she came to me for the first time a really long time ago, and she didn't have the money to start working with me. And she start, she did other stuff that she and her husband had been trying for like three years when she first approached me. And then she called me back a year later and said, look, I'm ready. You know, they had invested a lot of money in various medical treatments for fertility and to no avail whatsoever. And uh, one of the first things I, I told her when we did a history was that I thought it would be a really good idea for her to ask her doctor for a full thyroid panel with antibodies. She was aware that she had hypothyroidism, and she approached her endocrinologist who told her that it was completely irrelevant if she knew she had hypothyroidism to know whether it was autoimmune or not. And oh. my client came back to me and relayed that, and I said, absolutely not true. It makes all the difference in the world if you have regular old hypothyroidism you know, the, the nutritional approach is, is one, mm -hmm. you know, one set of, it's one set of nutritional approaches. And if you have autoimmune hypothyroidism, we are not just working on your thyroid. We are working on your gut. We are working on your autoimmune issues. We are working on, you know, kind of the whole cluster of stuff that can go along with Hashimoto's, some of those co-infections okay. and, and all of that other junk. So we sat down and we wrote an appeal letter to her endocrinologist together explaining and adding some peer-reviewed <laughs> research papers. And the endocrinologist ordered the test, and she did have Hashimoto's. And uh, mm -hmm. she went on the autoimmune paleo diet. She and her husband participated in my Feed Your Fertile Body program. And at the same time, the wife went through, I think, five or six individual nutritional therapy sessions to really individualize her work. And they got pregnant right at the end of our six-week program. And, oh, wow. And she, you know, they now, yeah, really exciting. The husband and wife were both just almost speechless, you know, at their whole experience because they went through such an ordeal. And part of that, it really is just that doctors are not ordering Hashimoto's tests for women in their reproductive years. I see a lot of women who get diagnosed after menopause and many of those women have been infertile and don't have children. And it's really, really sad to think back at, you know, at, at that loss. So, you know, for every woman in my practice who does get her doctor to order a full thyroid panel, there are two to three who do not. And most of those mm -hmm. do end up paying for those tests out of pocket, which I think is really unfair. Yeah, uh, I nonetheless, I would say you, it no, it kills me whenever doctors refuse to run the labs, especially when they say it's not important. I would say about 50% of the medical doctors that I have worked with have told me the same thing. Even though I had already been diagnosed with Hashimoto's, I remember specifically one doctor, mm -hmm. I was at my, you know, getting my annual blood work done and I asked him to, you know, I gave him the list. I'm like, here's all of the thyroid labs that I would like done, including the um, antibodies. And he's like... Yeah, I'm not going to run those because the antibodies aren't important. And I'm like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I just, I was like, that's it. So I walked out of the, the office. But yeah, that, it's heartbreaking to think of all these women who, you know, just finding out that and making some simple changes to their lifestyle and diet, they may have been able to have children. So that's where I get really scared yeah. because I'm, you know, I'm almost 35. And so I kind of feel like my clock is ticking. And so <laughs> it's like, I'm in like hyper mode now to try to figure out, you know, get to the root of everything that's going on with me. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk uh, about stress in a little bit. <laughs> <I know. laughs> I well, it's a I good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing you did walk out because, you know, 
getting those antibodies is important for you, mm-hmm. you know. And it is unfortunate that we're at this point where this full thyroid panel is not yet the standard of care. But to anyone listening, you know, if this is a concern for you, you very well can pay out of pocket and do this yourself. Yep. Um, so, you know, there's a lot involved in infertility and issues there, but you just shared a really cool case there in that just addressing the biochemistry and the nutritional issues, you were able to turn things around for this couple. And I don't think that that is the common mindset in our modern day. And it's very unfortunate because long ago, people didn't really have to worry quite as much as we do today. However, they did take the effort, the concerted effort traditionally to, you know, eat a a whole food diet and have that in place. So in terms of solutions for this, you know, you kind of gave a broad picture, but let's talk a little bit more about a little bit more of the pieces of uh, towards, uh, you know, really repairing the body and preparing the body. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, the, the, the place to start really is eating real food in its natural state, you know, as opposed to packaged, processed foods filled with additives. I think, you know, for every couple that is struggling to conceive or that is facing a history of miscarriages, definitely getting a full thyroid panel, even if it means paying for it out of pocket, it is such a good investment. Getting over any fears you have about healthy fats, just getting that out of your head. (laughs) You know, first of all, learning what are healthy fats, because a lot of people have a misunderstanding. You know, a lot of the time people think fats are bad, especially, you know, women who can came of age between the 1990s and the early 2000s, definitely got exposed to tons of low-fat propaganda. And then, you know, even if they're not afraid of fat, they may really have a misconceived notion of what healthy fats are. So they may think, you know, these unsaturated vegetable, you know, very processed vegetable oils are better than, you know, lard and egg yolks and things like that. So really educate yourself and go back to what our great-grandmothers ate, you know, those real food, you know, lots of vegetables, animal products that are raised on pasture without chemicals and, you know, that come with all their naturally occurring fats that that occur in nature. And definitely if you, you know, if you're stuck doing that and still have issues, you definitely need to remove refined and artificial sweeteners. These are just, there's no place for these things in a healthy body and in any quest for fertility, any quest for getting better, staying healthy. Trying a low allergen, nutrient-dense diet is really important. And I think that if you have Hashimoto's, you definitely have to go gluten-free for life. I mean, I describe it to people as, you know, in part, one aspect is you have basically celiac disease of the thyroid. People understand Mm. that. Uh, Mm. I think that a lot of the time in the gluten sensitivity world, there's kind of like this hierarchy where celiac disease is is the real, you know, quote unquote, gluten sensitivity and everyone else is just not real. We're all imposters if we are sensitive to gluten. And that is just not true. If you have Hashimoto's, you are, you definitely have, you know, the same need as a person with celiac disease to forego gluten for life. And even if you don't have Hashimoto's or another autoimmune condition, It's definitely worth doing a 6 to 12 week gluten elimination trial, reintroduce and see what happens. Some people do fine on it and some people don't. If there is Hashimoto's, I always recommend starting with the autoimmune paleo diet, removing, you know, not only gluten, but also some of these other foods that can really stress the gut and immune system can take so much inflammation and stress off the body and slowly reintroducing those after a while to see which ones you may get away with, of course, with the exception of gluten, you know, so the autoimmune paleo removes a number of foods and it's really bio-individual in the long term. Once you have done that initial, take the stress off the gut so it can really heal, take the stress off of the immune system so it can calm down, re-nourish the body with the nutrients that it's low in so things can just really kind of reset and recalibrate. Then you can start reintroducing some, some of these foods one by one and see what the person can kind of get away with. And, you know, there may be times when the person is feeling less well and has to, you know, take out some of those foods that they know they can sometimes get away with eating. So it's it's the process of checking in, you know, with your nutritional therapist and also with your body. It's both of those things. And part of my job as a nutritional therapist isn't, you know, hooking someone onto 
depending on me to tell them what they can eat day in and day out, but also really helping me train them to tap into their own, you know, to their body's innate intelligence. Because once you understand that and get away with, get away from that vision of, I just need to put food in my body. All food is the same, calories in, calories out, or even just, you know, some foods are good and some foods are bad. It's black and white. It's really simple. It's never that simple. It's never that cut and dry. <laughs> with gluten, it is. Uh, if you have Hashimoto's or another autoimmune issue, but with the others, it's not. I like that. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's just good that you said that, you know, the whole not black and white eating and, um, you know, because when you hear you got to take all these foods out, people get scared. <laughs> so that's it's yeah. good to to hear, you know, that it's a short term thing or, a, you know, if you're really sick thing. Anyway, yeah. keep going. Yes. And if you take those foods out temporarily, you are usually going to get a lot better pretty quickly. And then, you know, for example, this client that I mentioned ended up finding out that she had a serious intolerance to nightshades, the whole nightshade family. And uh, she got she felt so much better on AIP. And as she started reintroducing some of these foods, she realized she just could not get away with even a sprinkling of, of any nightshade on, on in any dish. So her husband changed the way he cooked because he had been using a lot of, you know, chili pepper and things like that. So uh, it was really an easy fix for them. And he saw how much better his wife looked and felt and he was so happy. And now they have a baby to hold. So it's, Mm. it's really, there's nothing better than that. They don't feel deprived whatsoever. And she has a really varied diet now. And um, she just knows that there are a few different foods that she can't have ever. And a few foods that she has to take out at times when her body and or mind are more stressed and that's it, you know? Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah. I've seen that yeah. very, very commonly. So let's not forget about, you know, things that are not food related. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So definitely beyond food. We have to always think about the total load that the person has of toxicants. Toxins, toxins are the you know, the poisons that we have inside our body, either produced by our body or by microorganisms inside our body. So, you know, a toxin would be something like the toxins produced by the yeasts in our gut that have maybe overgrown and gotten out of control. Toxicants are chemicals that we get from the outside that are not alive. So, for example, heavy metals, pesticides, herbicides, basically, you know, toxicants can be present in the air, in the water, in our food, you know, food, quote, unquote, not always food, agriculture, home and body care, even furniture and medications, of course, including vaccines. So we can't address all of these. And I definitely, you know, in my work, one of my main aims is to help keep people's anxiety low and their fear (laughs) low. So I always tell people, look, I am telling you this to empower you, to help you take stress off of you and your body so that you can become more fertile and unburden your overall toxic load. So the information that I'm giving you should not be used to, you know, for you to be terrorized and frozen and not know what to do. It is really just, you know, any step that you can take starting now, starting today and just keep moving forward. You know, are you using deodorant with aluminum in it? Stop using it. Let's find you an alternative. Are you using a toxic sunscreen? Let's get rid of that toxic makeup. Let's replace it with something non-toxic. You know, antibacterial soap, no problem. (laughs) I'll get you hooked up with something different that is not going to be bad for you. Synthetic fragrances, plastics. I mean, all of these things, we can take out so much stress from your body. Flame retardants, junk that may have been sprayed on your carpet, even mold. I mean, I know you, you guys had a couple of great podcasts on mold, and this is a huge one. I mean, you know, if you're living in a home that is riddled with mold, then that is not really going to do your fertility any big favors. So really just take, if you're spraying Roundup on your lawn or your neighbor is, that's a problem. It really is. So we just sit down and brainstorm what the main problems are. It's the person drinking crappy unfiltered water or crappy filtered water uh, <laughs> or toxic well water. This happens a lot. So we really just look at all those things and make a list of, of solutions. In a non-overwhelming fashion, obviously, you know, we prioritize. What can we do this week? What can we do next week? What can we do the week after that? Just baby steps. Baby steps always getting better. And before we're even done cleaning up everything, the person that's Mm -hmm. pregnant almost always. So, Yeah, it's good that you said that because I think people do, even though we say we don't want to overwhelm you, people do get overwhelmed. And so 
just hearing all of this yeah. stuff, you know, it's important to remember when you're listening that you can do the more crowding out of these things that you can do, the better. And you don't have to have all your ducks in a row and everything perfectly crossed off of that list before your body's capable of, of holding and carrying a pregnancy. So, but it's always, you Absolutely. know, the baby steps moving towards the optimal and away from the not so great <laughs> in every area of life. So yeah. it's good. Definitely. Yeah. Yep. So Absolutely. we always, always just so do the best we can, right? <laughs> I know it's about progress, yeah. not perfection. That is, I need to like yeah. paint that onto my walls. <laughs> <laughs> I, tend, I tend to be the person who I research a lot. I work with multiple practitioners, including Lydia. And so my anxiety and stress is not nearly as bad as it used to be. But I do have a tendency to get myself kind of wound up with all of the stuff that I should be doing. And, you know, I'm not doing enough or whatever. So I constantly bring myself back to that. It's about progress, not perfection. It's about making better choices today than I made yesterday. So I think that's a good yes. segue into talking about stress. And uh, and sleep, too, because sleep plays a huge role in all of this as well. So let's dive into that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, one of the first things they tell people is, you know, let's identify what your stumbling blocks are and come up with a plan to, you know, for steady and manageable and really, you know, and, and steady, manageable improvements that you can hold and that you can love, that you can really enjoy and feel proud of. Not something that makes you feel burdened and yoked to a program that makes you feel uncomfortable or just too restricted. So one of the things about that is really balancing your quest for improvement with your need. And this is a need. It's not a desire. It's not frivolous. Your need to not be overstressed. You have a birthright to not be overstressed. So if you are reading all these books and there are all these things that you should be doing and you're feeling stressed, you just have to take a step back and relax because stress really is one of the main stumbling blocks on the quest for fertility because the same hormones, the same hormone cascade that produces stress hormones in the adrenal gland, that those hormones are stealing the resources from our body's sex hormone production. So in men, they're stealing from testosterone. In women, they are stealing from the estrogen and progesterone family of hormones. And those are really the, the hormones that help us conceive babies and stay pregnant and have a healthy pregnancy and help babies develop. So this is, it's a big deal. The more stressed out you are, the less fertile you are, the more stressed out you are. Everybody knows this. Everybody has always known this from the beginning of time. This is why pregnant women have always been kind of guarded and surrounded by help and, and people telling them, don't, you know, don't overdo it. Don't get too stressed out. And, you know, telling everybody else around them not to stress out the poor pregnant woman because it is, you know, a delicate condition. It's not, you're not like a China doll that will break at the drop of a hat, but you are not unbreakable <laughs> either. So, you know, stress can be being too confined. Obviously, you want to get exercise, you want to get fresh air, but you don't want to be doing, you know, workouts that are exhausting you or restricting yourself so much that you are starving to death, things like that. Those are very, very stressful to the body and mind. Sleep, same thing, you know, when we sleep, our body is producing hormones. It is properly detoxifying, our cells are regenerating. It's really a process of renewal during sleep, renewal of the hormonal cycles, renewal of the circadian rhythms, replenishment of the adrenal glands, replenishment of the liver, replenishment of the thyroid gland. So, you know, especially for people with hypothyroidism of any kind and Hashimoto's in particular, proper sleep is one of the main important things to, you know, to get you back on track in addition to nutrition and you know, just really a clean environment around you. So sometimes we can get stuck in the cycle where we are not sleeping and we can't sleep and because of dysfunction in the body being so rampant, either due to toxins, intoxicants, either due to, you know, poor lifestyle habits, too much work, stressing too much. So this is a really good time to sit down and make a plan of everything extra that you can just shed and let go of because with the moment you are ready to start a family, that is a huge priority. Most people are ready to make changes 
for the health of their baby, for the health of their pregnancy, and for their family's future that they would not make just for themselves. People are a lot less selfish than we often give them credit for, you know, both men and women. I've seen people make, you know, huge changes that benefit their own health for the rest of their life because of their motivation to conceive that baby and to help that baby be as healthy as possible because that's that's all we want for our offspring is really for them to be healthy and happy. And this is what this is all about, really. Yep. Awesome. I love that. <laughs> love it. <laughs> yeah, it's true. And and we've covered a lot of this before in podcasts and on our site. So it's putting it all together uh, again of how to overall support the body, you know, and just thinking about it ahead of time rather than after the fact or you know, taking for granted, oh, I want to have a baby. I'm just going to have a baby, you know. So it's it's good to kind of yeah. think about all of this. And it's, you know, it's something, it, it's a big driving factor for you and why you created your, your program that you did because, you know, more and more we're just needing that extra push and help and support to prepare the bodies of both parties, you know. So um, yeah. we'd love to hear a little bit about your program that you have available in case anyone's interested in checking that out. Yeah, definitely. So the Feed Your Fertile Body program, I mean, I feel like it's just the culmination of why I even, you know, (laughs) stopped working in in the academic world. I was teaching at, uh, I was teaching at the university level literature in in Italian language and stuff like that. It was fun. But I felt after my third son was born, my third child was born, my first child was a daughter. Uh, after my third child was born, I just really felt this huge calling to to help people heal their bodies and rebalance. And I actually, you know, I actually have never had a fertility struggle <laughs> ever, but I know people who have. And I felt the blessing of being, you know, being a parent and not struggling with fertility. I've had my share of health struggles, believe me. But, you know, the blessings and the gifts of being a parent were really what called me to help other people become parents of healthy children to the greatest extent possible. And, you know, because having a child, holding your own baby and knowing that that you did everything you could to bring your baby as healthy as possible into the world and are going to move, carry that forward, you know, for the rest of your life, for your child's good, that is, you know, why we are here, why so many of us are called to be parents or, you know, called to be aunties or uncles. Not everybody has to be parents. Uh, you should not feel guilty if you do not feel called to parenthood. That is definitely one of my other cornerstones there. So this is really why I designed the Feed Your Fertile Body program. I mean, initially, I went into the Nutritional Therapy Association training wanting to help couples conceive healthy babies and wanting to help children grow healthy. And, um, You know, I started doing private consultations. I actually, you know, started out with a general practice. Like so many people just starting out, I actually needed experience. And whoever came to me, you know, whatever kind of problem, I was like, sure, no problem. I I did not feel like I wanted to start out just working with fertility, but it was really my main thing I wanted to do. And uh, as I moved forward, I started seeing similar patterns in couples that were struggling with infertility. And I decided to design uh, a six-week program to really help people optimize their economic investment. So I wasn't just, you know, getting paid individually by every single person who came through the door to give the same basic nutrition education that everybody, everybody needs. So it is a program that I designed for couples and, you know, couples when, when there is a couple or for singles, when it's just singles, single parents by choice. I have also worked with couples who have been working with, you know, with an egg donor, a sperm donor, or even a surrogate, a surrogate mom. So sometimes we work directly or indirectly with a third party to the greatest extent possible if the third party is actually known to the couple. So it's exciting. It's cool. It's it's flexible. You work with supporting the bodies, the minds, the spirits of the people, and just really keeping it lighthearted. I started out running groups out of my home in Berkeley when I was still living in Berkeley until until July of 2015. It's actually my one-year anniversary today of being in Italy again. And now I've, I've been doing my work remotely, so I, I work with couples. I offer either a self, self-study self program that couples can do to move through the program in the six modules at their own pace, or I sometimes offer live online groups 
via video calling. And then there are a number of nutritional therapy practitioners and nutritional therapy consultants who are offering the program in their practice. And that was, you know, a big leap that I made early in 2016. I just felt like, you know, I felt so much reward from, you know, getting all these thank you notes from couples who had gone through my programs, pictures of their babies, the eldest baby born from a couple who went through my program in an early incarnation is about a year and a half old now. So that's, it's really exciting. And you just staying in touch with these families and knowing that I helped them conceive is, it's such a gift. And uh, so that's why I decided to make the program available to nutritional therapy practitioners and nutritional therapy consultants who want to have a fertility and families focused practice. And, uh, you know, they get the benefit of my years of experience and practice and, and all the hard work that I did putting together really a, a program that I think is, is really strong. It has a workbook. It has six modules. Everything is broken down. You basically end up doing a, a, pant- a full-on pantry overhaul in those six weeks without even really noticing it because every week you're taking out a few foods, adding in a few foods, trying some recipes. There are a lot of different, you know, in the appendix section, there are, there's a, a full cookbook, lots of pictures. And, you know, just lots of different nutrition templates that people can use and try out and, you know, how to put together meals. I I hate planning meals for people because, again, we talked about innate (laughs) intelligence. I I don't want to tell people what they should eat on Tuesday. They should look at all the lists of of these nourishing (laughs) foods and go, oh, yeah, I really want zucchini and blah, blah, blah today, as opposed to, you know, me telling them to do this, do that. I give them the raw materials, the moving parts, and they figure out how to put them together. And I am available for answering questions if they have any questions about those things. But um, And I really love having a team of other colleagues who are offering the program because then collectively we can, you know, we can do more work and more good than, you know, just one person working on their own. So it, it, I really love having that community, not just of parents who have conceived through the program, but also of practitioners who are working together to help build families, to help build health in the new generation. I mean, the real mission of my work is to help every, you know, every parent to be, fulfill their birthright to become parents of healthy children and the birthright of every child to be, to come into this world with the best possible health, you know, with the best possible epigenetic framework that we can provide them with in this you know, toxic and complicated and stressful world that we live in today. Awesome. I love it. Yeah, that sounds like an absolutely amazing program. I know that'll be very beneficial for a lot of people. Yeah, thanks. It already has been. And it's just so inspiring to hear their stories and feel their gratitude and and just know that there are many more people out there who can benefit from it. Absolutely. Well, this has been awesome. I'm so glad that you were able to come on the show today and talk a little bit about this. You've given us some really good starting points for people to start thinking about, you know, if they're getting ready to start a family or they're concerned about their fertility, you've given everybody some really good info of where to kind of get started. And then from there, they can, you know, formulate a plan. I like your idea of sitting down and formulating a plan of how you're going to get there so that Lydia knows I'm a planner. So that's something I'm going to do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So awesome. Yeah, it's great. So it's really a good idea to get support from a trained practitioner when you have, you know, a targeted goal for your health. And uh, I think that Sarah's really put together something awesome. So if you're listening and you're in these years of getting ready, or maybe you've tried and and haven't gotten uh, had success, consider, you know, getting involved in a program or getting a practitioner to help you just to keep you focused and, you know, target things that maybe you're missing and that kind of thing. So thanks so much, Sarah, for coming on and talking about this topic. It's it's important. I think it's becoming more and more important anymore. <laughs> and it's good to yeah. have this approach available to people, readily available in, in many ways, actually. And, you know, because we're not getting in through the medical community. So People are taking their health into their own hands, but DIY health isn't always ideal either. So getting getting the support is great. So thank you so much, yeah. and uh, hopefully people will uh, benefit from, from this podcast today. Yeah, thank you so much, both of you, for having me. It was nice speaking with you both, Lydia and Jessica, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. You too. Thanks. <laughs>
Bye. Thank you so much for listening to the Vibrant Health Podcast. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day to listen to the information we're sharing. If this information resonated with you and you know others who could benefit from it, we would love it if you'd share it with them. We'd also be very appreciative if you could leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. If you're on our sites or YouTube listening to this, we'll have links down below where you can leave a review. If you're on your phone uh, listening through the app, you can also leave a review directly through the app. It only takes about a minute, super fast, super easy, and your shares and reviews help us reach more people with our message of health and wellness. So we really, really appreciate your support. If you're looking for more information on health and wellness in general, both Lydia and I have a ton of information on our sites. You can find me over at jessicaespinoza.com, which is my main practice website and where I offer my 21 day sugar detox coaching. And in the future, I'm going to be offering nutritional therapy coaching as well. You can also find me on deliciousobsessions.com, which is my main real food and natural living website. You can find Lydia over at divinehealthfromtheinsideout.com where she offers nutritional therapy consultations and hair tissue mineral analysis services for those who are ready to take their health to the next level. Lastly, if you have any suggestions for topics you'd like us to cover in future episodes, we would absolutely love to hear from you. We want these podcasts to be as informational and inspirational as possible, and we'd love to hear from you and understand exactly what you would like us to cover. You can email us or leave a comment below or even give us a shout out on social media. We both look forward to serving you and inspiring you to live the healthiest, happiest lives possible. Thanks for listening.